Good afternoon in New York. Good evening in Rwanda, Europe, and Israel. And welcome whatever time of day or night it is for those joining us from the rest of the world. I'm Yael Danieli, founder and executive director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention, and Treatment of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, ICMGLT for short. Thank you for joining us. This International Center for Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma webinar is held in collaboration with the Genocide Survivors Foundation in observance of Rwanda's official week of mourning, which follows 7 April, the International Day of Reflection on the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. This year, Kwibuka, or remember, 28. Between 6 April and 15 July, in just 100 days in 1994, about 800,000 people were slaughtered by ethnic Hutu extremists who targeted members of the minority Tutsi community, as well as their political opponent, irrespective of their ethnic origins. Tragically, today's confluence of threats near and far challenges us almost daily to yet again resiliently hold the promise of never again without giving into despair. In ICMGLT style, based on multiple expertise and differing life experiences, today's international participant expert, participating experts will discuss parenting and the challenges of raising children after the genocide. Your moderator is a clinical psychologist, victimologist, and traumatologist who has devoted much of her career to study, to studying, treating, and preventing multi-generational impacts of massive trauma to victims' rights and to reparative justice. Our first presenter, Marie Grace Gasingwa Kagoire, is a Rwandan researcher with a background in international health development and experience in community mental health and peace building approaches. Grace is currently interested in understanding how Rwandan youth born after the genocide narratively construct their genocide memories. Her published works focus on effects of genocide among women survivors of rape, intergenerational legacies of the 1994 genocide, and its psychosocial effects among post-genocide youth. Today, Grace will report her data on intergenerational legacies of the genocide. Therese Uwitonze, our second presenter, is a clinical psychologist and founder of the Mental Health Dignity Foundation, MHDF. She completed her bachelor's degree in 2007 and master's program in clinical psychology and therapeutics at the University of Rwanda in 2018. She has been working with traumatized Rwandans. In 2012, she founded MHDF, a local NGO dedicated to addressing Rwandan society's acute needs for balance, psychological help and support, providing mental health care, thereby contributing to peace building in the community. Born in 1976 in Kisagara district in the South province of Rwanda, Therese is married and a mother of four. Today, Therese will briefly report MHDF's mental health findings and focus her presentation on intergenerational examples 
from her clinical practice. Last but not least, Jacqueline Moraketete is an internationally recognized genocide survivor, speaker, and human rights activist. Born in Rwanda, Jacqueline was nine years old when she lost her parents, all six siblings, and most of her extended family to the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Jacqueline's story has been featured in many media outlets. She founded Genocide Survivors Foundation as a vehicle to continue her genocide prevention efforts and raise support for fellow genocide survivors. She has received numerous prestigious awards for her work. Jacqueline earned a BA in politics from New York University and a JD from Benjamin M. Cardozo School of Law. She lives in New York City with her husband and two young children. Today, Jacqueline will share some of her challenges as a mother of two young children and challenge the expert to help her and other child survivors of this and other genocides cope with them. We have about an hour and a quarter for the webinar, though we have been known to run over time. Each speaker will talk about 12 to 13 minutes. Following an interchange among us, I will open the floor to questions or brief comments from the virtual audience. Panelists will then conclude with last words, and I will conclude by announcing our future webinars. Please use the chat function, and we'll do our best to respond to as many as we can. Feel free to direct your questions to a particular panelist or to the full panel. I give the screen floor to Mary Grace Gassigua Kagoire. Grace, the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yael, for your introduction. As uh, you shared already, I will be speaking about uh, intergenerational uh, legacies of the genocide with a focus on uh, uh, communication and parenting in the post-genocide Rwanda. Uh, in the post-genocide Rwanda, people who stayed in the community had lost many of their relatives. There have been imprisonment of the suspected genocide perpetrators, but also survivors had to live in the same communities as perpetrators. Many children grew up in uprooted or household headed by women due to loss of many people in their families but also due to imprisonment of many men who had participated in the genocide actions. Parenting became an issue because of the genocide experiences related to the genocide actions or the genocide uh, experiences. Here I mean traumatic experiences that survivors had witnessed. Uh, as you can read through the following quote, one of the genocide the perpetrator spouse shared, it is difficult for those children born before the genocide to have the same understanding about the genocide with those who were born after. Those for whom the genocide happened before they were born do not accept that it happened. They are difficult to raise. They do not like to go to school, they refuse to go to school. Frankly speaking, it is difficult for us parents to explain the genocide to the children born after they ask endless questions about the genocide. It is very difficult to help children born after to understand what happened. This has been shared by Mercy, who is a spouse of a genocide perpetrator, as I said. So 
the focus is on the patterns of communication about the genocide in families of perpetrators and survivors. But I will also speak uh, a little bit about what is shared and what is not shared with in a, a particular emphasis on the post, um, on the challenges associated with uh, the silence or the disclosure by parents. Uh, uh, the data uh, that inspired this presentation had from a qualitative study conducted between 2019 and 2020-21 in Eastern Province of Rwanda, which and the study included uh, 52 parents in 80 focus group discussions. Parents were aged between 5 to 36 years during the genocide. And also, data are from two focus group discussions among the post genocide the youth aged between 24 and 30 years. And this data for perpetrators and the survivors. And the, the analysis was based on thematic analysis. So, what are the intergenerational legacies among the genocide survivor parents? Most of the parents from the uh, survivor survivors' uh, families shared that they were afraid of not being able to conceive other children again after the genocide, as it is stated by Daniela. She said, in the aftermath of the genocide, I longer give birth to other children because of endless thinking about my relatives I had lost during the genocide. I felt there was no need because my family had been finished. I did again after the country was safe. Many parents also had the feelings of being unable to become a dear parent again. When they gave birth, there was poor parent-child relationships within the family due to limited contact and the lack of parental care following self-isolation and spending much of their time living in the past and thinking about the people that passed away. There was silence or difficulties of communicating unspeakable experiences witnessed during the genocide. Another issue was the trauma among most of all the genocide survivors. Other parents uh, we became irresponsible because of losing the test for life. An example was also given by Daniela. I have been a bad parent. Whenever I thought on the problem I went through, I used to speak to my small children with a bad heart. I want them not to continue cause me stress because I also do not have parents. Some parents felt that they did not fulfill the parental law and they, they developed irrational behaviors such as drinking as a coping strategy. Most of other parents had the fear for harm toward their children, hence they chose to overprotect their children through impeding them to socialize with other children. Among um, their descendants, a number of legacies were also listed. Most of the descendants of survivors used to ask endless questions about the genocide without having satisfaction due to lack of information about the family's past experiences, mostly due to parents' difficulties to provide such narratives or due to the wish to protect the children from being harmed by such a traumatic past. Other children reported that they felt uprooted or they are incomplete due to growing up in perished families. They grow up having frustrations, confusion to, due to lack or having fragmented genocide stories, especially family experiences. There was a shift in the role where, where children had to parent to, to do parents of their own parents instead of parent parenting their own children. Most of the children even if they go to school, but sometimes they choose not, not going to school, which also results from not having a meaning of life. They also develop irrational behaviors and feel isolated even if they, are, they were born after the genocide. What was found among perpetrators' families include feeling guilty and ashamed because of the genocide actions. Most 
of the mothers felt the Grace, you are. Uh, what happened? Looks like her internet must have locked her out. Uh oh. Gotta get her back. Okay. Was the husband, mother's was husband, um, committed the genocide. Also, felt they were not married to raise the children when their fathers were imprisoned. They struggled to communicate genocide activities or action during the genocide by own husband. There was no influence over their children because uh, they had to raise them alone. And there was also a complicated relationship. Parents were disrespected by their children, feeling as if they do not deserve to be called the parent again because of their genocide perpetration. Some parents also were traumatized because of their, their um, actions or due to prison experiences. They were worried about marriages, prospect of their children, and some of them also devoured their children and insulted them being angry. They thought, especially mother thought, they were difficult. And sometimes they used to fight with their children, especially when children asked a lot. Sorry, uh, Grace, your, um, I think your PowerPoint is not shared right now. Could you reshare it? Okay. People are asking. Okay, let me do so. Sorry. Well, it happens. Yeah. It doesn't feel far away, but we are far away. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can you read it now? It, it's about to come up. Yes, wonderful. So you can, if you can just yeah. move, and move it to where you are in your okay. presentation. Yeah, okay. okay. Other, other parents and children reported that uh, children have endless questions. Why did my parents take part in the genocide? Toward uh, which end? For which good? There is an ability of, of children to understand the motives behind their parents' involvement in the genocide actions. Children used to blame their parents for committing the genocide act. They also have shame in the psychological distress following running of their parents' perpetration action, actions or sometimes due to imprisonment. And sometimes children who were born, especially from the prison, are not considered, not recognized in their host communities. Sometimes they treat parents as useless, not deserving respect because of their uh, perpetration identity. Uh, Besides this, there are other common uh, legacies uh, like uh, co common legacies among, bo among both descendants of genocide survivors and those of perpetrators. Some children became rebellious, aggressive, drug abusers, and stubborn due to lacking of parental care. They are isolated, sometimes avoid discussing the, the genocide experiences out of fear of adverse outcomes. Sometimes some uh, youth chose to leave their families to settle in other uh, settings, especially children born of uh, perpetrators or children born of rape. The difficulties understanding what happened in 1994 genocide, here marriage to get out of family stress, fear or mistress of the out group, and intergenerational trauma. Here I will share some causes of intergenerational trauma in both groups. The first cause that uh, came out from uh, the data include listening to overly detailed or explicit stories of horrible atrocities committed against or by their parents. Sometimes the parents shared these experiences without knowing the consequences, but children developed um, a kind of trauma because of the fear associated with that uh, disclosure which sometimes was not prepared, well prepared. 
there is, um, as this was shared by a genocide survivor parents, parents, they often tell stories of what they saw during the genocide. Some may say when they killed the son, so the son, I was there watching, or may say when they shot one neighbor, I was watching. So you find that from time to time, they keep on narrating about what they saw happening. That's an indication that the horrible things they saw has unrooted in their minds and hence constantly recalling and retelling the terrifying atrocities committed. This is the main reason for developing a mental trauma in your children. The second cause narrated by uh, Respondent included living in socio-economic poverty or poverty-related distressing situations, sometimes magnified by the genocide consequences. The third reason or cause of the intergenerational trauma is being born in uprooted families. Some thought that trauma is inheritable or it is born with. Some others uh, thought that intergenerational trauma among uh, the descendant is from witnessing emotional pain, suffering scars due to cutting the parents suffered during the genocide, as one of them testified. My children also have a trauma or a hamuka in Kinyarwanda because of seeing me being traumatized. My brain is always boiling. This is because of thinking deeply about my life, not achieving anything due to being one person who has to do everything. Thank you for your understanding. I would like to stop by here and um, listen to the question or comment. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Grace. You did it with great grace. <laughs> uh, Thank you. <laughs> Therese, would you please take the screen? <laughs> yes, thank you, Dr. Danedi. I would like to share with you Perfect. my clinical work. Mm -hmm. Let's share. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> We are is, it <laughs> is it visible now? This is the email from Rabbi. Uh huh, from Rabbi. Yeah. It's okay to me to share. So, so while you are looking, let me just reflect that what you, part of a dimension of what you heard in Grace's presentation mm -hmm. is the dimension of heterogeneity. People respond differently mm -hmm. to, to trauma. And uh, I think that came out very, very clear and we will, in the discussion period, we will reflect on how similar it is with other genocide survivors as well and their children. So we don't just have one survivor way of, of, of responding and one child of survivor way of responding. Uh, that's a very important lesson. And again, thank you, Grace, for your sensitivity and ahead of time, Therese as well. Please, Therese, go ahead. Yes, thank you for the, this opportunity, Dr. Daneri. I would like to share with you uh, about the intergenerational legacy of 94 genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda, um, refer to my clinical work. The Mental Health Dignity Foundation was founded in 2012 in order to face a big need for psychological help and support within the society and provide mental health care and contributing in peace building in the Rwandan community. MHDF is a continuing professional development provider for clinical psychologists in Rwanda. In my study of 138 individuals from family with domestic violence, in 2018, 
I found 65.1% of post-traumatic stress disorder rate among spouses, partner, and 46% among offspring. A current review of 109 clients saved by MHDF 2022 shows that 87.3% suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. 83.3% suffer from traumatic grief. 86.5% suffer from anxiety. 77.3% suffer from depression. 20.18% uh, suffer from drug abuse. And 16.51% suffer from suicidal ideation. MHDF client, um, we have uh, our client are uh, composed by families, include adults and children of survivors, perpetrators of 94 genocide against Tutsi and the Rwandan diaspora returning. MHDF clinical work is characterized by those following activities. Mental health club in secondary school for youth, community education, where we teach parent, youth, and the teacher about interconnection between conflict and mental health. We manage every year the case of emotional crisis during commemoration of 94 genocide against Tutsi. We offer to the people who experience the traumatic event, we offer them uh, individual therapy where we treat those different traumatic events they experienced in order to be balanced, to heal from what they experienced during genocide against Tutsi and uh, what they experienced after genocide because we have also different violence. We offer to Rwandan community or we facilitate different group therapies in the community. And we have trauma survivors groups in the community, couples groups in the community. We mediate conflict party in order to live in a peaceful way, managing what we experienced and also the consequences we have after genocide against Tutsi. About international legacy, I would like to share with you some examples of uh, categories of those international legacies of uh, 94 genocide against Tutsi, according to my observations and, uh, and experiences from my clinical work in the Mental Health Dignity Foundation as a clinical psychologist and a therapist who work as a volunteer. Category one, we have interpersonal violence within families where we observe psycho psychological, physical, sexual, and economical violence through those uh, aggressivity toward others, anger management problem, verbal abuse, lack of communication, suicidal thought among family members. In order to respect the confidentiality of our client, I would like to share with you, but respecting confidentiality issues. This is a son of a perpetrator of 94 genocide against Tutsi, who is very aggressive within the family. He tried many times to kill his family members using a cooking knife. His mother stated that he is similar to his father, like father, like son. The second category of intergenerational legacy of 94 genocide against Tutsi, we have an example 
of burden of shame and the guilt carried by children of perpetrators. During the commemoration of 94 genocide against Tutsi in Rwanda, the daughter of perpetrator of 94 genocide against Tutsi cried the road. I tried to calm her down with relaxation exercise, but it didn't work. She was referred to a mental health nurse with whom we collaborated. And she was prescribed medication. After ensuring her safety, I met with her for a session to address her psychological condition and provide her with mental health psychoeducation, during which she described why she felt that way. She said, when I heard how the Tutsi were masked during 94 genocide, it reminded me of how my father killed the Tutsi during 94 genocide and then committed suicide. Category three, children of survivors also have PTSD symptoms, especially during commemoration of 94 genocide against Tutsi and also due to the family violence experiences. Here we have example, which can help us to illustrate those intergenerational legacy of 94 genocide against Tutsi. The son of a survivor prayed with a stick. When his mother, a survivor, saw her, her child praying with a stick, she saw a bludgeon, a bludgeon. It's a heavy stick with pointed metal part on the top. Her per per perpetrator used a bludgeon repeatedly to hit her head and back to try to kill her during 94 genocide against Tutsi. Because of the stick her son played with, his mother beat and physically abused him. Because of the parent's actions, the son cried the road and was afraid. When I hit my son, the mother declared, I'm going to kill him. After 25 sessions of psychological accompaniment with narrative exposure therapy, she has stopped abusing her son. Another example in this category, during, during a secondary school commemoration of the 94 genocide against Tutsi, a daughter of a survivor suffered flashbacks, fear, and a lot of crying. And uh, I utilized relaxation exercise to help her calm down. After ensuring her safety, I met with her for a session to address her psychological condition and provide her with mental, mental health psychoeducation, during which she described why she felt that way. She said that she remembered her parents telling her about how her grandma and grandfather were killed during the 94 genocide against Tutsi and the way they were brutally murdered with traditional weapons, machetes, bludgeon, sword. Category four of intergenerational legacy of genocide against the Tutsi. Community issues include the conflict between survivors and the perpetrators who have returned to the community. The family of a released prisoner and the genocide survivor is exposed to violence. When he went home after his incarceration 20 years, he discovered his wife had two sons from two different husbands. As a result, the family members violated each other psychologically, physically, economically, 
and sexually husband, wife, his proper children, and those children born outside the marriage. The two children born outside the marriage used to insult, quarrel, and fight a lot with their stepfather, the perpetrator of 94 genocide against Tutsi. They don't know their father, and they are considered as the root causes of conflict in the family. That is why the perpetrator suggests that their father must come to pick them up so as to resolve those disputes. After 35 therapeutic sessions, the perpetrator told me there is an improvement of the relationship between me and my wife. Now I have managed to peacefully live with those children born after the marriage, outside of the marriage, and have already paid for the first child's school outfit. And he is currently studying in the branch of construction here in Rwanda. As a result, I would like to solicite your support so that my children can also join this mental health accompaniment because I want my whole family to have mental well-being. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Therese. Uh, we are so enriched by both your presentations. I'm sure people in the audience are learning, 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 and having a lot of feelings <laughs> and making a lot of connections to their own experiences and to experiences of people they have known or seen. Or if they want to simply understand where violence, that violence begets violence and how. Hmm? As I said last but not least, Jacqueline is here to challenge the experts as to how we prevent the transmission. Now that we heard all of these dark, <laughs> dark, but with help, brighter, uh, legacies. Jacqueline, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Danieli. Uh, I also want to begin my uh, brief remarks and questions by thanking the International Center for the Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma uh, for organizing this program and to thank you in particular, Dr. Danieli, because uh, all these years, all the past 28 years, you have been with survivors. You have always been there to uh, provide support to survivors like myself, survivors of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and have contributed a lot in our healing journey. So I want to thank you on behalf of survivors. Uh, and I want to thank you. And I want to thank our distinguished uh, panelists uh, for their uh, presentations. Uh, I really do believe that this is an area of, uh, of study that is critically important um, and that is very much timely because even those children who were just one year old in 1994, they are 28 years old now, they are 29, and many of them are parents and they are dealing with uh, the challenges that face us as a uh, young uh, survivors' parents. So this is critically important. It is timely. And I think it's something that uh, myself and other survivors have very much uh, been interested in. And I'm one of those people who always believes that it's very important to deal issue with issues like these. You know, instead of pretending that they don't exist, uh, instead of saying that, you know, we are all doing good, we are, everything is going to be fine, we're resilient, which is true. Uh, being a survivor and working with survivors, I know that survivors, for example, we are, you know, they are the most resilient people. And over the past 28 years, we have tried very hard to move forward uh, with our lives. But unfortunately, because of what we experienced uh, in 1994 was so unnatural, was so inhumane. You know, I always say that genocide is the worst crime that human beings can commit. The human body, the human mind, the human eyes 
was not meant to see what we witnessed in 1994, seeing our families being murdered, seeing women being raped, living in, a, in an environment where each day we did not leave, we did not know whether we were going to leave to see the next day and we're being hunted day and night simply because of our, uh, our ethnicity. So people have to really understand that having gone through the, that type of experience, the lasting impact, as you know, Therese and uh, Grace have shown us, it's a, uh, it's it's a, uh, our experiences have a lasting impact, and all of us are really interested in how we can uh, minimize passing on our painful memories and uh, the traumatic uh, experiences that we suffered to um, to our children. Uh, and I always say that you know, survivors. Again, every day we, we do our best to move forward. We feel that many of us, myself included, feel like we are here for a reason. Uh, and those of us who have been blessed to be parents, uh, we consider it the greatest gift. Because myself, as the only survivor, as you mentioned in my bio, as the only survivor in my media family, uh, having been blessed with two children that I have today, this has been the greatest gift to me to be able to continue my family line. And it brings me the greatest of joy. But I have also experienced uh, many challenges uh, because my genocide experience always finds a way to interrupt even the most basic uh, routines. Uh, I always say that, you know, for survivors, uh, a good friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, Noem Chimo, uh, who's one of the most, uh, the best advocate, one of the best advocates for survivors that I know. She, in his article, he talks about how the genocide always finds a way to interrupt uh, survivors' daily lives, always finds a way to force itself uh, in our present uh, life. And uh, I recently attended an event where, you know, a Holocaust, I heard a Holocaust survivor uh, say that all of us as survivors, we try to move forward from the past. We do not live in the past, but the past lives in us. And that's a reality that people really need to understand. Our experiences comes about uh, in, 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 in everyday activities and routines. It can be a simple sound, a simple smell, a simple image that you see as you're walking down the street. And that sound, that smell, that image, will all of a sudden change your mood uh, for the day. Uh, I could be at a party and if I hear a balloon pop, I'm gonna start thinking about the, the gunshots that I, he I used to hear during the genocide. I could be going down the street and if I smell something that reminds me of uh, a smell from my village growing up, I'll start thinking about my village and the children, my childhood friends, my siblings who are no longer with us. Uh, the other day I went to a store to buy something and I saw a, a hat that reminded me of a hat that my father used to wear. So an everyday routine such as going to a store can suddenly become into something that is uh, very difficult to manage. And myself, and I know I speak for other survivors, uh, and I've spoken to many of them through my work, uh, Genocide Survivors Foundation. When we became parents, we also started experiencing new manifestations of trauma and, and our painful experiences started finding their way in, 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 in our journey as a parent in ways that we never expected. I always tell people that I could be putting my, I could be bathing my children and all of a sudden, you know, when I'm watching, when I'm bathing my daughter, I'll start thinking about uh, the days when my mother used to take myself and all my siblings to a nearby river and would wash us and would bathe us. And if I'm washing my son, I will think about my youngest brother, who was just a few months old uh, when he was killed uh, in the genocide. So again, like an activity like bathing your child, something that is supposed to be bring a source of joy can suddenly take you back to these uh, very, very type, uh, very, very difficult memories. And the other thing that, uh, you know, as parents, obviously, you always hear that it takes a village to raise a child. All of us who have kids realize that. And, you know, I think the biggest challenge for survivors is that that village uh, was destroyed by the genocide. Most of the friends that I have uh, survivor friends do not have 
their children do not have a single grandparent from uh, any side. No paternal grandparents, no maternal grandparents. I'm very fortunate that my, my kids at least have, uh, you know, their paternal grandparents, but most of my friends, don't, their children don't have. They don't have aunts, they don't have uncles. There is no support system that is uh, in place. And most of us really became mothers not having had mothers. I was nine during the genocide, but you have kids who were two, who were three, who grew up without a mother figures. And here we are, and we have to be wives and we have to be mothers. <laughs> and there are a lot of uh, you know, skills and lessons that were lost that we never had. So all these things lead to uh, a variety of challenges, uh, as you can imagine. And 20 years after the genocide, many of us are a place where, as you know, it was mentioned in a presentation, a lot of our, our children are starting to ask us about our experiences. My oldest is five years old. I have a five-year-old and I have 15-month-old. And I never actually thought that the questions will come that early, but my five-year-old has already asked me, you know, where, where, are, where are your parents? What happened to your parents? And so far, I'm, my response has really been not answering at all. I've been trying to find a way to distract her and not have to deal with those type of questions directly. But I know that it's a matter of time when I'm going to be forced to answer those questions. I have a dear friend recently, uh, her daughter's school had a grandparents breakfast. And this child does not have a single grandparent. And my friend was just so overwhelmed with a sense of, 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 of pain and sadness. And she did not know how she would tell her child that there will be no grandparents at this grandparents breakfast um, at the school. So as parents, we are very much interested in how best to communicate our experiences uh, with our children uh, in a way that they understand their history because I know personally and many survivors, we want them to know what happened in Rwanda uh, in 1994. We want them to know about the genocide, but we are interested in how to best communicate this information in a way that does not traumatize them as we've seen uh, through some of the clinical work uh, that, uh, by Therese and the, the research by Grace. So my first question is really about communication. If you have any insights or best practices based on your work, that you can provide to me and other survivors, uh, mothers, survivor mothers in the audience about the best time. How do we communicate our experiences? Our age, at what age should we tell it, be telling our children? Obviously, it depends on a child, of course, but if there are some you know, common across the board uh, insights that you would like to share uh, in this area. And uh, the second, and I think again, the most, uh, the ultimate question that most of us as survivors are really, that keeps us up at night is how do we minimize passing on, you know, our trauma and our painful past to our children? We already seen through the presentations that we, we, we've, we, we've seen how, you know, the children are being affected, you know, uh, the inability to go to school, the interpersonal, the, fa the, the violence within the family, the violence within, uh, within the community. So again, if you can share some of the uh, best practices that um, you've seen or you have in terms of how do we minimize passing on this, uh, this painful past uh, to our children and certainly grandchildren, because I think at the end of the day, all of us want to be you know, protect our children, we want to be healthy mothers. And I think, you know, uh, a better one, a better world really depends uh, on having uh, citizens who are healthy, uh, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally. So any, any, any insights and best practices you can uh, provide uh, in this area and uh, specifically, again, how do we minimize the transmission uh, of trauma will greatly be uh, appreciated. So thank you very much. You understand, all of you understand now why I insisted with Jacqueline that she participate in this panel. Um, and and I, first of all, I'm, I'm, I find myself moved to tears. I, I, 
have the time here. Um, I know those children. I saw them in, in her womb, actually. <laughs> so. so. Ah, Grace and Therese, are you sort of ready for such an immense task? And let's acknowledge that the questions are immensely important, deeply originated, and that the task is, mm -hmm. is huge. There are no simple answers, certainly not one answer for, for all, uh, mm -hmm. as you know. So, um, but uh, Grace, Therese, and a little bit I too, maybe, uh, maybe not today, maybe in future webinars, we will have a series of these webinars. So we don't have to have the final answers, everything done today. Mm -hmm. Please, uh, just to mention to all of you, um, uh, I'm jumping the gun. Uh, on May 9, uh, also on Monday at 1, we will have a panel of children born after the genocide against the Tutsis in Rwanda. Okay, and they will have something to teach all of you too about what to do and what not to do. <laughs> and when, and when, yes or no. So uh, uh, children are extremely wise. Don't forget they're also very forgiving to many of our mistakes. <laughs> also children, as we've learned from children of Nazi Holocaust survivors, but so many others. Uh, in my writings, I speak about reparative adaptational impacts that they, that in, they incur. Uh, all of the children, I believe, consciously or not, have as the main mission to repair the world for their parents and for themselves. Uh, and when that's your job, you forgive a lot. Uh, <laughs> but you pay a price, of course. So let's remember all of that. Uh, who wants to start? Therese? Grace? Mm -hmm. Therese, go ahead, then Grace. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline, for your questions. Um, if I, I understood very well, you asked about our experience, concrete experience, in order to minimize um, transgenerational trauma. And uh, also, when the how to communicate with our children about what we experienced related to genocide against Tutsi. Yes, I think I can start by the, the, the second because uh, from my, the experience, yes, you can see some uh, answers related to the first question, I think. Um, in my clinical work from 2014, I participated in a commemoration at secondary school where I saw the, the young, a student who born after genocide, they started to, to manifest the same symptoms, PTSD symptoms, crying, flashback, fear, and so on. And I tried to, to support, to support psychologically those students at school because it was the school where my, my child studied. And I support the student, uh, we saw, uh, 20 students who experienced the emotional crisis because of what we, we experienced here, genocide against Tutsi. And they approached, I tried to use uh, different uh, techniques I learned from my university, from different trainings, a relaxation exercise for calming down their emotional crisis. And uh, when we started to share about how they feel, yes, I recognize they are affected by what they, they hear from their parents, what they observe. When they visit memorial site, they saw 
the the body there and they are uh, they experience those emotional crises and uh, i started to to create different um, or to develop different uh, techniques or different uh, approaches or uh, yes i introduced the mental health club at secondary school regrouping grouping young people informing them about what is conflict what is the consequences what is the health what is mental health how conflict and the virus are connected for introducing and helping them to understand what you experienced. I started by far away for helping them to understand the sign, the symptoms they present now. And I shared with them those relaxation exercise, very simple exercise, briefing exercise, um, labyrinth. Those are the concrete techniques I use. I taught them in order to manage their emotional crisis related to what we experienced here, genocide against Tutsi. And I introduced different sessions to meet with the young people, and I created the occasion to share what they think about what we experienced, how they can contribute in order to prevent, to manage, and also to diagnose, I started also to diagnose consequences of genocide against Tutsi on their mental health psychological aspect of the young generation. And uh, I identified different symptom, symptoms and uh, we continue to meet, to teach students at secondary school. Until now I have 12 secondary school. We work together and I introduced mental health club in order to facilitate the young people to understand what we experienced and also to address different conflict so, so you're talking primarily about uh, using the school environment to yes. uh, to, uh, to 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 give what you call psychoeducation to yes. these children to help themselves, uh, yes. which is of course very important support. Uh, but. Let's remember that both you and Grace are in Rwanda. Jacqueline lives in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we don't know if the school is here. Uh, mm -hmm. um, first of all, no. If people are taught, uh, if they're banned from, <laughs> from teaching, um, so, uh, so maybe we can go more. Uh, uh, Grace, would you please also cover more within the family ways mm -hmm. of communicating mm -hmm. and preventing attempted prevention? And thank you for putting the uh, for putting mm -hmm. the reference to your article to share with everyone. And please make sure to email it to me too. So and put it in the library of the center, right? Very important. <laughs> and uh, all of your articles, please, all of you in the audience, <laughs> because I'm sure if you are here, you have relevant publications to be in our library. Um, Grace, would you please go into the family during, during growing up? Uh, yes. Uh, I would even start. I would even begin if you want to to play with me on this. Uh, uh, what is it? What about when the woman, the mother, is pregnant? The father is also, of course. Uh, and what do they expect? What are their hopes for the children? How do those hopes for the children maybe affect? Uh, how they behave towards the children. We, again, in the Holocaust area, we focus a great deal about that. Uh, and we, of course, will continue learning and teaching each other. So we learn from each other all the different layers of complexity that we need to learn. Uh, so Grace, the floor is yours. Take the challenge. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Danieli. If I 
understood well, uh, Jacqueline is asking us how best as um, parents can communicate our past experiences. Here, I understood that she wants to know how to communicate traumatic experiences, such as the experiences during the genocide. Thank you, Jacqueline, for your question and the, uh, sharing your experiences within the family. Uh, coming back to your question, I would like to say that there is no single way of doing this disclosure. This is because parents have been affected differently. Parents went through uh, uh, different experiences. They live in different settings and their family context, the way they communicate in the families are also is also uh, different. But it, some 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 authors, some theories suggested that the communication. Let me just start by the period of communicating. Some theories suggest that the communication about such experiences should, should start at least between five and seven years. But what or how do we communicate? The communication about mm -hmm. traumatic experiences goes slowly by slowly. As a parent cannot give her child or his child the whole packet of bread to eat it, it at once, mm -hmm. Parents are encouraged to share a little by little as we give our children slices of bread. This means that it, it is up to the parent to, 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 to feel herself, to have self-awareness, self-awareness, to know herself. And also when the child is still small, it is encouraged to communicate a little and respond very close with very close answers. I am not encouraging the silence, but for instance, if the child asks you, where is your grandmother? Where, where is my grandmother? It is easy to say, my grandmother is no longer alive. Maybe the child can go further and ask why she's no longer alive. In case the parent does not feel free or able in that moment to communicate such a traumatic experiences, she, can, she has the right to explain to her child that she is not able to explain to, to, to the, those experiences or such story that day in the postpone day the disclosure or the, 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 the discussion to apologize politely and say that one day she will share. But also in case you feel you, 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 are, you are there, you are well to share that you will not do harm to the child, you can share a little by little, explain a little by little. But what helps children most this I speak as um, as a, a professional who works under the community-based social therapy program, where most of the parents, especially mothers, every time they communicated, but of course they did so after making some steps in the hearing, but they otherwise concluded their discussion with their children about the past traumatic experiences with a resilient message. Yes, this happened to me, it happened this way, but I managed to survive. I did this and this, and living after is possible. When children notice that uh, their parents, because children look at their parents as role models, when children noti notice or realize that their parents are strong enough, then they also develop um, resilience. They do not feel overburdened or overwhelmed by the traumatic experiences. Children think, yes, because my mom or my 
uh, I was able, I was also able, and this uh, helps uh, the family to protect their children. So I will encourage, encourage parents to share a little by little and conclude it with a very positive message. Thank you. Maybe um, Therese can add, but uh, let me stop by here now. I will maybe come back when I will be speaking on how to minimize the intergenerational transmission of trauma. Thank you. And, and maybe mm -hmm. I also would like to add, uh, first of all, in, in some of the examples Therese shared, she actually showed how working with the parents and helping the parent heal had positive effect on the children, right? It made it, 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 it immediately, not immediately, it took time. It had, mm -hmm. but the effect showed. Mm -hmm. uh, now, again, you also remember that your baby uh, has a brain, has a heart, right? Emotions and feelings and, and thoughts and is capable of, of getting at different stages of life, is, is able to take in and, and write and contain mm -hmm. different kinds of information, different depths of feelings, mm -hmm. right? So, and you know your child. You know your child. You know your mm -hmm. child because your child is there with you day in and day out. Mm -hmm. Now again, in those times where you, when you are yourself overwhelmed and you feel you're not there, you're someplace else. You're in the village. Mm -hmm. That's okay. It's okay to take time out yeah. for, for mm -hmm. you, for you, mm -hmm. and and to find people who would understand you and help you heal, soothe, right? Help you take care of you. And they, then you'll find a better way to be there with your child and also to do exactly what Grace suggested. Uh, so, um, and I, yeah, that's part of what I, why I asked Therese to elaborate on, you know, the results of therapy on the families because, and you heard that when the parent is able to contain their emotions better, when they're able to put the whole horrible package together, which is actually, I believe, impossible in principle. <laughs> I mean, Jacqueline said it very well before. No one should experience this. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, Elie Wiesel, until his last moment, said we don't have words. Mm -hmm. He literally died believing that he, the most articulate survivor, did not have words to express what he experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we all yeah. should be humbled by that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's true. Hmm. So, yes. so um, I, look, this is long term, <laughs> and we are here together, and we will continue with this. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to have easy, silly, one line solution. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe <laughs> what we hope is we did open the door together at least for, for people who are with us today, over 200 people mm. who are with us today to, to take it in, to, be, to make it a part of themselves, to share with the challenge. Because Jacqueline, you're right, the village is destroyed, but mm -hmm. we also create villages together afterwards. Mm -hmm. And we are a village. That's why we created the center Right? Well, that's why you created your foundation. That's why Therese created her. That, that's why we keep enlarging, right, our villages. So we help each other. And we help the next generation repair the future. So they're not alone in this burdensome task. Right? 
Now, it, you, everybody <laughs> understands why we always run out of time. And the levels that we try to, to, to that we try to uh, examine and explore together are not just, a, you know, easy information to take and to share. Uh, shall we open the floor to people in the audience to ask their questions? I know, Therese, you, you, you want to say more. I want to say more. Jacqueline wants to say, all of us are bursting to say more. We will. This is not our last webinar. Okay. So uh, we have 64 comments. Oh, my golly. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, uh, okay, let's try together to figure them out. Um, and uh, and we are going to run over time, so I hope everyone stays with us. Those who must leave, the, the recording will be, you will receive the recording. The recordings are avail is available on the center's website. Our library has so much information. And before I go to answer these questions, I want to acknowledge two colleagues. One, Mary Fabry, Dr. Mary Fabry, who is on the advisory council of the center. Uh, and she's the co-chair of the working group on indigenous issues. And she's the one who introduced the center to Therese. And I also want to, and to acknowledge uh, Maggie Israeli, who, who I met recently, who did us the great favor of, uh, she, she's also in the working group on indigenous issues, who introduced me to great. I, I God bless both of you and I look forward to work together with you. Also to all people in the audience, uh, some of whom are uh, on our board, I can see some questions. Um, most of the comments just tell how wonderful you are. So we must have chosen right for the presenters. Uh, okay, I'm going all the way I see, back. Dr. Daniele, I see there's a separate Q&A uh, ah. here. I don't know if you see that. You, you see the Q&A? Yes. People put questions there? Yes. Oh, they did both. Yes, so uh, there, is, uh, there are some people who put the questions in the 70s. Okay, so days. let me go to the Q&A, but don't worry, I'll go back to the chat. So uh, again, even an anonymous attendee said, thank you for great ideas to your presentations. Uh, then there is a question by track, Patrick Muhira, I would like to ask about therapy sessions you conduct. Does it play a role in forgiveness and relationship restorations, or it's only for personal level mental well-being? Uh, Therese, I think this is for you. And please answer briefly so we can really answer many, que many questions, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Yes, I started by offering or providing mental health care, psychological support, but at the end, the results can be also forgiveness. I have some, case, some cases who, uh, as a result of uh, uh, individual therapy, they forgive, forgive their perpetrators. Thank you. It's uh, superhuman. Uh, Patrick, we will have a special webinar on the relationship of res res resilient religiosity, spirituality, uh, and multi-generational trauma. So you might want to watch out for that uh, when we, when we, uh, you know, in future. Uh, thank you, Therese. Um, it's a rather complex question indeed. Another anonymous attendee uh, for presentation number two, uh, Grace, 
therapists, they report that they use, no, 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 that is Therese again. Therapists report that they use narrative therapy. So does this approach only work for these cases or there are other approaches that can be used? Thank you for the question. Yes, narrative explorer therapy is the one for treating traumatic experience. Uh, and uh, I use also MDR, eye movement sensation and reprocessing. And uh, for treating traumatic grief, I use interpersonal therapy. And I use also nonviolent communication in order to, to facilitate peaceful um, situation or improving the good relationship between family members. Yes, uh, I have many approaches I use in order to overcome psychological disorder and also improving relationship among family members and in the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, uh, again, I'm, I'm also glad for the question. Uh, there, are other, there are several approaches, not just one, of course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the field of trauma has been very active trying to find the, the most relevant one. Uh, but we always come up with, it's never just the most relevant one. And I think there's a general agreement, the relationship between therapist and patient uh, is so important that it's sometimes more important than whatever the technique you use. So let's not forget that thinking about the village. Karen Trader Lay is asking, how can the African lessons of genocide and the work of genocide survivors inform survivors of war inflicted trauma that children and survivors experience, or even survivors of severe famine that causes massive death and survivor trauma? What global organization should have responsibility for working this genocide trauma? Refugees are helped to resettle, but perhaps not much may be done on trauma. Uh, do you want to take that or should I? I can support me. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Grace, do you want to take a try or should I try? Um. um. Let me just say one thing. Traumatic events destroy uh, human uh, body, human ways of thinking, of interacting well with others. It de destroys human beings in their entire well being. Let me just say it like that. Uh, coming back to the interventions, I think in the humanitarian settings, like in refugee in refugee settings, what is what is mostly done is helping people to settle in to 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 to, to just uh, to deal with the, the 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 event of war or the other human atrocities, but. Uh, I will shift and speak about the, the, the experiences from Rwanda and Congolese refugees, where I use it to train uh, community-based social therapists and uh, conduct some research. Where I, I social therapy helped some, some refugees because they've been there for so long to settle in, to not to diminish their way of thinking that they will live tomorrow, that they will go back to their homes tomorrow, and they started to, to, to accept, to live in the context. They did their hopes of living tomorrow, and then they start to work for themselves as if they will stay there. That is important, but it is still very difficult to achieve that goal, to, to help them that way, when the trauma is still acute. Let me stop by there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Grace. Uh, Karen, I would try to add uh, that 
Actually, there are many organizations who are involved in this kind of work, some better, some less, some more with good intentions than with solid knowledge. Uh, but uh, there is an organization, in addition to our International Center for Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, uh, the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, which I've been honored to also to found, uh, and I was first woman president, uh, <laughs> which I'm always proud of. <laughs> uh, again, uh, has quite a few presentations uh, and, and members who are expert in this. What I would like to specifically mention here, based on my own studies, um, in my own instrument of research uh, that we found um, that actually there are differences among people who live in what they experience is their homeland and those who, who live in the diaspora. Also, that partly led to my suggestion to the United Nations actually that a refugee situation is actually a rather promising one for preventive measures, for helping parents and parents-to-be so that they don't, uh, so they, they mitigate the trauma, the intergenerational push to be transmitted. Okay, so, uh, so Jacqueline, that goes back to your question, right? So even before you're a parent or in, in when you are a parent to little children, working with you or, and not necessarily um, uh, professional mental health work, it, it, whatever, right? Um, creating that village feeling, the healing village feeling and the repair can be done in refugee situations as well. What I, I, I was very touched, I don't know how many of you saw that picture of, or, or from Ukraine, and I'm sure that's part of is on your mind, uh, of a mother trying to explain to her daughter why they have to run to leave the house, why they have to say goodbye to the father. And she was, she said, I don't want to say the word war to her. I don't want to teach her that word. So it was a protective, right? It's, 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 so yeah, it's, all of this is totally irrelevant. We're talking about profound suffering of people. Unfortunately, the world is full of it. Our friend Faye Paris says, thank you everyone and to Dr. Daniele for speaking on the right to self care. This event provokes much thought. Uh, can you discuss the positive impact that creativity plays as a means of expression and as a form of therapy? This is for anyone who wishes to answer. Thank you again. Anyone? I think we can have a special session on that, Faye. You push me, you make sure to push me to have that. And we will have sessions with actual artists, children of survivors who will speak. Uh, it can help, uh, absolutely. Uh, but again, it's not the be all and end all and the only solution, et cetera. Okay, another anonymous setting. The, I can't read all the way down, bearing witness in listening space is so, imp oops, oh, I lost it. Oops. All right, guys, I lost it totally. I can read it. Uh, would you please? Yeah, no problem. Help me, Jacqueline. Yeah. Yes, I see it. Bearing witness is a listening space is, oh, sorry. Bearing witness in a listening space is so important. As a common community, we must hold each other's humanity. 
and each other's trauma. This is a secret, this is a sacred listening. Yes, and we pay, uh, yes, it is sacred, yet we pay a price for it. Uh, as we do for most choices we make. So, okay, I lost it. Jacqueline, so would you please run through the Zoom, uh, the, not Zoom, I mean the chat, and pick the questions? Okay, uh, let, me, let me try. We have... Uh... We most of the comments are complimentary, and thank you for your compliments in the name of all participants. But pick some of the questions that are um, are questions. Okay, so uh, okay. Uh, this is a question: Is mental health care affordable for the average person in Rwanda? Is the stigma associated with it diminishing? Excellent question. Therese? Therese and Grace. Oh, good. I'm here. I'm back. Therese, do you have an answer, please? <laughs> uh, is it possible to repeat the question? Yes, the question is, is mental health care affordable for the average person in Rwanda? Is the stigma associated with it diminishing? So can most people in Rwanda afford uh, access to mental health care and is it has a stigma associated with seeking mental health um, support diminished over the past uh, years since the genocide? Ah, good question. Yes, um, as a um, clinical psychologist and therapist who work every day in this domain for providing mental health care, what I observe, Rwanda need to be supported psychologically. Uh, imagine I have 109 clients as one clinical psychologist. You see, sometimes uh, I receive many clients beyond of my capacity, and I try to refer them to my colleague in different institution at the hospital. Now, the uh, Minister of Health um, recruited clinical psychologists at the health center. Yes, it is started to, to be recognized. It's very important because uh, before or after genocide, we thought only about physical health, but now Rwanda start to recognize the other aspect of, of health, mental health, and the social health. That's why we have now many clients. They ask for psychological support. They, they, they can use their phone. They can write via WhatsApp. They can call me during the night. Yes, it showed me how. It's very important um, to be a to accompany psychologically Rwanda. Thank you. It, and it's of course a, a very important question throughout the world mm. in terms of number one, knowledge and appreciation of the importance of mental health and also affordability and availability and access. Mm -hmm. uh, these are challenges. Yeah. I, including in COVID, everywhere, actually everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. okay. uh, our board member, uh, Dr. Dean Adjukovic, uh, 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 commented that um, very um, that he found parallels and he found the presentations extremely important parallels with Croatia and the wars in in the Balkans. Uh, sort of in the same decade uh, that happened, that run happened. Then there's a question from another uh, board member of the center, Harold Kudler. In the years immediately after the genocide in Rwanda, American and European mental health professionals who had gone to Rwanda to help reported that local people were not easily able to engage with the forms of psychotherapy 
usually cognitive or exposure that we're offered. From today's presentation, it sounds like it, that has changed a, good, a great deal and that these treatments are now more acceptable and are providing help for, are provi providing help in Rwanda. Is this, or proving helpful in Rwanda, is this an accurate observation? And if so, do you have any thoughts about how this came about? Harold, this is a whole webinar, but go ahead, do your best, Therese or Grace. <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe Teresa will come back on that, but I would like to come back on the affordability of, of the mental health care or say, or you, you can therapies. Stop and then Therese can speak. Go ahead, Grace. Yeah, I would like to, to just uh, I'll let uh, now community based approaches are being uh, promoted in Rwanda because they help many people within a short time. And because these approaches are bottom up, de developed from uh, the grassroots, uh, they help people because they, they are the ones who define how they understand the things and how cultural this is best for them. So even if the Western approaches uh, were judged um, to provide a little that had limited, uh, a, a limited uh, effect, but now some of them are being contextualized so that uh, they can help uh, some people, but also the community-based approaches are being developed and promoted to help uh, many people, the communities, which which may contribute to both hearing and the social connection, mostly. Thank you. Maybe Teles con can continue with uh, your That's brilliant. previous Thank question. You. Thank you so much, Grace. Mm -hmm. Teres, do you have an observation here too? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I understood the word, the question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, was, it was rather technical, it's okay. He, mm -hmm. uh, uh, can you answer whether there has been, um, I will take just a piece of the question to ask you, has there been uh, a change in Rwandans um, acceptance uh, of mental health uh, treatments uh, uh, from, the, from the past to now? Yes, we, we observe the change because uh, we can start by uh, creating this um, department of clinical psychology to create the after genocide against Tutsi. And uh, in the big, uh, from 1999 and then uh, 2006, uh, it was the time for uh, introducing clinical psychology as a master's program. You see, that was the, the, the say, sign which show us how it changed this, uh, our community recognized the importance of mental health. Yes, and uh, during this period of COVID-19, the Minister of Health introduced, introduced clinical psychologists and the mental health nurses at the health centers because they, now they observe the need of healing from what we experienced. Absolutely. And uh, uh, they recognize, they accept now uh, I'm a clinical psychologist who work in the private sector. They accepted to give me permission from RGB, Rwandan government board, governance board. They gave me permission to work as a private, but it, before it was not easy because it was a new, a new domain new uh, few skills, few, few knowledge you, you can imagine. And then now, yes, it's open. You can work in the public sector. You can work in the in um, uh, public and private sector. It shows us how there is some improvement in order to understand what is mental health aspect. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see, now we have the research which show we talked about the post-traumatic stress disorder. Now we have research from Minister of Health. They show us how the problem is now in Rwanda. 
Yes, it means there is some improvement and mm -hmm. we hope we'll continue also to, to grow in this domain uh, because we have many expert, uh, expert from outside who come to support us and we continue also to, to work in order to, to improve, to develop mental health domain as a clinical psychologist here in Rwanda. They gave me also permission to, to train my colleague as a CPD provider. I have now 577 clinical psychologists who follow my training and I share the knowledge I have. We share experience from our field, Rwandan field in order to see how to support Rwandan community in order to have mental health for well-being. Yes, mm -hmm. we contribute. When, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. when I first came to Rwanda, uh, there was one psychiatrist who was going to come back from either Belgium or France. And there wasn't even a department of psychology at the university. Mm -hmm. um, and I was told that, well, granted, it was very early. I was told that people need roofs over their heads, not mental health. And I said, well, when they have roofs over their heads, they need mental health to put the roofs over their heads too. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate, uh, you can now see that I have expert colleagues in Rwanda which is like, ah, <laughs> which is so amazing. Uh, so uh, people are, um, okay, Eugene is, okay. Uh, Eugene is saying that triggers are every word, are everywhere in, answer, in response to you, Jacqueline. Um, somebody, uh, Kian, Daniel is saying, what suggestions would you give to a stepmother who did not experience the genocide? How do we share the information with my sons whose father is a survivor so that they can understand but not traumatize? I think, uh, 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 Kiana, uh, Danielle, I think some of the answers that uh, my expert colleagues, Grace and Therese, uh, answered before might very well be applicable in this situation as well. But again, what's important is also to, for you to know how you feel how knowledgeable you are. How do you feel about sharing the knowledge you have? Uh, how did you feel when your husband told you his stories or doesn't tell you? Uh, so first, know you. Uh, but, you know, like we had in the group project for Holocaust survivors and their children, we had groups for children, we had groups for spouses of children, we have mixed groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you for, for bringing that to the discussion. Uh, love and admiration, this is so good to know. Um, Jacqueline, do you find any other question? You're going with me, right? Um, right, Faye, Faye, you wrote your question both in the question and in the, I think. Let me go uh, down and see. Yes, I think we are just about okay until our, our next webinar. I would like to, uh, for the for each one of you to think of your sort of last word while I tell people about our upcoming webinar, okay? So please, Grace, Therese, Jacqueline, last words. But uh, think about them, but I am I'm going to just speak 
for a minute. Uh, as I said before, we named this webinar Rwanda One because it focused on the parental side of post-genocide intergenerational legacies. Rwanda Two, which is in collaboration with the Rwanda Foundation, an organization I've been involved with since its inception, will be comprised of and focused on children born after the genocide. Rwanda 2 will take place on Monday, May 9, again at the same time. But before that, because April is Genocide Awareness Month, on Wednesday, April 20, that's next week, at 12.30 Eastern Daytime, to meet Armenia time, we will hold a webinar in advance of April 24, which is the day of commemorating the Turkish genocide of the Armenian people. Launching the documentary, The Desire to Live, its producer, Peter Bahalawanya, has made the film available for free for webinar registrants from April 14 through 24. Peter from California, Marianne, the film director from Armenia, and Guyane Kay will be the speakers. Then for Holocaust Day in Israel on May 2, we will hold a webinar on the award-winning film Kaddish with Yossi Halevi Klein, the protagonist, Steve Brand, the filmmaker, and Yael Danieli, the Chief Humanities Advisor. We will send the particulars to all of the registrants of how to watch the film with a very special low rate of $2.99 uh, before that. Uh, as you know, we, try, we offer all of our webinars free, but for some of the activities we, we and we, appreciate your moral support, uh, but for some of the activities, we appreciate financial support for those of you who can afford it. Uh, it would really help in many ways, uh, but this is not the ultimate message. The ultimate message of this webinar is the last word, the words that we will now hear from our three amazing speakers. Uh, uh, how about if we go in the same order? Uh, would you, Grace, be the first one? Okay, thank you, Dr. Ayel. I would like um, to thank everyone who attended this webinar and the share that both silence and the disclosure of past traumatic experiences may uh, contribute to positive as well as negative effects. But when um, one is able to share with others, it's the, one of the ways to make meaning of the past. And when you are able to make meaning, to make sense of what happened to you personally, you all, or, already have strength to know how you, com you can convey your past traumatic experiences to others. That is why um, some people choose to meet and share their experiences or go for a therapy to just find the meanings out of their experiences. So thank you all. I hope we shall meet next time. We will. Eres, please. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone, who was here in this webinar in order to share about our experience, what we lived in Rwanda, in order to, to share, to think, to reflect together how we can prevent the transmission of trauma, to, uh, to pre how to prevent the transmission of violence. Uh, in order to prevent, we need to, to know firstly what we, we experienced, seeing how to treat ourselves. And after 
helping our children to, to have a good values, uh, learning how to communicate between us non-violently in order to create a good world, if I can say, because as a human being, we are all need healing, we are all need peace of mind and also health. Thank you. Thank you, dear Therese. And yeah, I don't think I have much yes, to add. Mother. Yes, my dear young mother. Jacqueline. Um, <laughs> after I have already, I think uh, Therese and uh, uh, Grace have already said really what I was going to say. Uh, the first thing I want to say is to thank you again for organizing this critically important program. As I said, it's important in many ways than one, and it's very timely, uh, particularly for those of us who are survivors of the genocide in Rwanda. This is a time when we are really battling uh, these very difficult uh, questions because immediately after the genocide, people were rightly concerned about putting roofs over our head and putting food on the table. But a lot of us are realizing, as I said, that why are we are striving not to live in the past? The past does live in us and our experiences affect in many ways than one, uh, our daily lives. So it is very, very important that no matter how difficult these truths that we're talking about, these realities we're talking about, I think that knowledge is power, as I said, and the more we know, the more we can create a better parenting journey, the more we can create better families, uh, better citizens, a better country in Rwanda, and a better world, because at the end of the day, uh, the world needs people who are health, healthy in, in not just physically, but mentally and emotionally. So this is incredibly important. And I'm happy to hear that it's just the beginning uh, in this long journey of learning and uh, applying and trying to move forward with, uh, with, uh, with positivity and with, you know, peace. With positivity, but also it's okay to cry sometimes, and it's also okay to scream sometimes. And you know my number, anyhow. So <laughs> I want to acknowledge. I, I only now looked at it. My colleague, my colleagues from Agahoso Shalom Youth Village in Rwanda, uh, and I want to take this uh, <laughs> as a as a um, as a time for invitation. Um, Please, any great idea that you consider great, that means to organize more webinars that would be of help, not just parting information, but also will be of help to people. Uh, please write to me, write, write uh, oh, oh, I asked permission in, all presenters said it's okay with them to put their emails on the chat, right? Therese, Marie, uh, my Grace, Jacqueline. Uh, so we will put our email, all of our emails on the chat, write to them, write to me, and let's go on with what matters most to you. Because granted, I'm sure it will matter most to us too. I don't want to say goodbye. This is ridiculously difficult. <laughs> I, I, I love you very much. And uh, we will stay together um, and work together in the future yes. uh, to indeed repair the world as much as possible and make it better for, for generations to come. This is what we are here for. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>